All right, well, welcome to Programming Paradigms. And uh, looks like we all know each other. I don't think I'll bother taking role. <laughs> so, um, Wait, I don't know everybody. Do you want to have a little round of introductions? Yeah, I do. I'm Professor Warford. You are Danny. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is a, uh, a junior senior level course and uh, I have up here on the screen the course web page and the course web page has um, a copy of the syllabus on it. I decided to not distribute the syllabus on paper this year. It's there, you can download it. There's office hours. Uh, the uh, email for me and the course webpage site for you to access um, the course. And uh, there will be um, there will be three exams. Exam one is September 26th, exam two is October 24th, and the final is on December 11th. And there's some information here about my late homework policy, but that's all the same as it has been in the previous classes that you've had from me. Okay, so um, any questions about anything so far? All right, now um, another um, uh, thing that we have on the web page here are a list of the required texts. Now actually I think I'm going to uh, postpone this for a minute and bef um, after I give you some additional information. And also on the, uh, on the course webpage are a list of the slides. So now this course, um, I have done a really extensive job of, of um, producing the slides that I'm going to show. And those are all available for you online. So I don't really think it's going to be that important that you take notes in this class because all the material is, is, is pretty much, you know, available to you online. I even have, uh, you'll notice here that there are, there are some, um, those are the slides, but there's also going to be a set of notes. So, um, that, I, that I'm going to use to um, go through the material with you. So I would rather have you think while we go through this stuff, all right? Now, um, so the title of the course is Programming Paradigms. So the first thing we want to learn is what is a paradigm? So a paradigm is a pattern of thinking that is frequently difficult to change. It's kind of like when you get stuck in a rut in the way that you think. All right, and uh, another way of looking at it, it's a worldview. Have you known some people that have a certain worldview that's different from your worldview, and when you try to talk to each other and, and you know, make an argument or something, you can't really, it's difficult to communicate because this person has a different worldview and can't quite see things from your perspective? Okay, so that's another example of two different paradigms, two people holding two different paradigms or worldviews. And the interesting thing about programming paradigms is that the same thing exists with, in computing with different pro paradigms. In other words, there are different ways to view a certain uh, problem. And if you get stuck in that certain way of viewing it, then you miss a whole other world of possibilities, all right? And, and so what we want to do in this class is we want to explore different paradigms, different programming languages and ways of thinking about problems from different from the way that, we've, that you've probably done it so far. So the objective of the class there's, um, is this. We are going to learn three major programming paradigm models and that are different from the ones that you've probably um, are familiar with so far in your academic career. So you know we start off here what's the programming language you use in your first course? 
what was the programming language that you learned in your C++. first course? C++, right? And then even in data structures, it was still uh, C++. Now, have very many of you guys had um, computer systems? Yeah, we learned Java. That was another programming language. And also in the computer systems course, remember what, what was that lower level language? Assembly language. Assembly language. So those are, those are all different programming languages. But now, for the most part, all of those languages had one particular worldview or one particular paradigm, and that is called the procedural or the object-oriented model, right? But what we're going to learn in this class are three different paradigms, and they are, and we're going to do them in this order. The first one is going to be the functional paradigm, and the second one is called the declarative or the logic paradigm, and the third one is called the concurrent paradigm. And unless you've had some previous experience with this um, before, these are going to be two, these are going to be three completely different ways of looking at solving problems. And the thing about each one of these paradigms is that each one has a programming language associated with it. And so um, what we're going to do with, the, with each one of these paradigms is we're going to learn them one after the other. So see, a, an alternate way of looking, an alternate way of studying this would be to, to do all three of them at the same time and to see how they differ with each, you know, you see what I mean? We, you, 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 we could, we could try to learn each one, you know, you, how, how, how do you like those questions when your English professor or your history prof professor tells you to compare and contrast? Mm -hmm. You know those compare and contrast questions. Okay, we could compare and contrast each paradigm with this feature, compare and contrast each paradigm with this feature, compare and contrast each paradigm with this feature, and try to sort of do them all in parallel. But that's not how we're going to do it. We're going to immerse ourselves in one paradigm. We're going to get that view in our, you know, in our mind, and we're going to solve a bunch of problems, and do a bunch of programming. And then, after that paradigm is done, we're going to quit it, and we're going to go on to another paradigm. And each time you quit one paradigm and you go into another paradigm, what's that called? Paradigm you, shift. That's a paradigm shift. Have you heard that phrase? That is a... Okay, that's, a, that's called a paradigm shift. And so what is a paradigm shift? It's, it's when you have to stop thinking one way and start thinking another way. Okay, so probably what's going to happen is today we're going to start, today will probably be a paradigm shift because we're going to learn a new language and a new way of looking at things that is kind of like different from the way we've, we've done them before. All right. Now, the programming language that we're going to use for the functional paradigm is called Scheme. And let me say that Scheme is a dialect of Lisp. Now, have you guys ever heard of Lisp? Does anybody know what Lisp stands for? The word Lisp? Anybody? It stands for list processing. That's what Lisp is. So the fundamental data structure in the Lisp language is the list. Okay. And um, for many years, we taught we when we were teaching this paradigm, we we used common Lisp. Um, but it then Scheme came, out, came along, and it is, a, it is a, a dialect of Lisp, and they gave it another whole name. It's called Scheme. And then, <laughs> and now there's, I'm not sure why they called it Scheme, but you know what a Scheme is, like when you scheme to do something <laughs> evil. <laughs> but anyway, for some reason, they, they named it Scheme. And then what happened was, a couple years ago, the guys... Uh, the guys who um, developed the Scheme uh, IDE, what's an IDE? 
<laughs> integrated <laughs> development right. environment. They, they developed this, the integrated development environment that we used for, for Scheme was called Doctor Scheme. And then what they did, and so that this really makes, gives you an image of somebody <laughs> evil, Dr. Scheme. And then what happened was they added uh, different languages to it and they, they extended it so far that they said, you know, this really isn't Scheme anymore. So guess what they called it? Racket. Get it? <laughs> they were scheming, so that this is a racket. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the integrated development environment that we're going to use here right away at the beginning is called Dr. Racket. But Racket is really comes from Scheme, but Scheme is really Lisp. So frequently, I, when I, when we, I'll say Lisp when you know, you know, Lisp is, Scheme is Lisp and Racket is Scheme. And anyway, so that's the name. All right, so that's going to be the programming language for the functional paradigm. For the declarative logic paradigm, the uh, language is going to be Prolog. And what do you suppose that is a contraction of? Pro would be what? No, what is it? What do you write all the time? Programming. Okay, so it's programming for what? Logic. Okay, so that's the declarative logic paradigm, prologue. And then the third one is the concurrent paradigm. Now, the thing about the concurrent paradigm is that it is by far the most important one. So if you see when the exams are scheduled for this course, we are not going to spend as much time on scheme or on prologue as we are going to spend on, concurrent, on the concurrent paradigm. And you know why that's so important now? Because virtually every computing device now has more than one what? Processor. They're called cores. Have you heard multi-core processing? I mean laptops, even phones now, even mobile phones now have multiple processors on them. So what's happening is those two processors are executing their, their programs at, concurrently at the same time and there's a whole different way of thinking. There's a paradigm shift that you have to make when you go to concurrent processing. But it's a really important one because concurrency is now happening. It used to be kind of rare, but it's happening more and more and more now in the industry. So we're going to spend more time on that. And the programming language we're going to use for the concurrent paradigm is Java and C++. <laughs> so now, what, was, what is C++? C++ is is a superset of C, and what did they add in C++? What did they add to C? Object-oriented programming, right? So what do you suppose C minus minus is? Yeah, well, actually, it's a subset of, well, yeah, it's a subset of C, not a superset. It's kind of like a subset. But on the other hand, they did add a few things. And what they added was concurrency. So we're going to learn some concurrency things with uh, C minus minus. But that's not an, that Java is an industry standard. C minus minus is not. C minus minus is, is a academic tool. All right. Yeah, question? Mm -hmm. When you say scheme is a dialect of Lisp, what does that mean in this context? It's a dialect. It means it has the same, if you look at a scheme program and you look at a Lisp program, they look very, very similar. They look alike. They have the same, uh, a, very common syntax. And the basic data structure for both of them is the list. Because Lisp is list processing. You see what I mean? So it's not true that every scheme program will execute as Lisp because there's a few things that are different about it, but they're minor. It's like a dialect of a language is like that language, but there are minor differences. Right. So it's the same idea, only it's with these artificial languages instead of a, a in natural language. Okay? Is everybody, is everybody good? All right, now before we go on, I want to, there's this one great quote that I came across years ago and um, by John Prevost. Uh, he he w was working at, I, I don't know him, he was working at Ars Digita at the time and I, I ran across this quote and I just think it's great so I always think it's a good motivation for what this course is all about. But let, check out this quote. A good background in different, in different programming languages has given me the ability to think outside the box of one language style or another. So what is, think, 
What do you, what do, you do when you think outside the box? You've got to make a what? Paradigm. Paradigm shift. Think outside the box. Look at it from a completely different angle. Okay? Without this background, I would not be as valuable to my decidedly practically minded company, even though we do not generally use theoretically interesting languages. So this guy is saying, look, you learn how to think outside the box, you learn how to do these different paradigms, you learn, you learn how to make a paradigm shift, that makes me more effective because I can problem solve better. So I'm not stuck in a rut, okay? A certain way of looking at the world, computing world. All right, now let me say a word about the books. Um, because we're doing three different paradigms, we're gonna have a different book for every one. And in fact, for the concurrent paradigm, we're gonna have more than one book. So that's really bad. I, I uh, apologize for requiring so many books, but that's the bad news. But the good news is, for the first one, the book is titled Concrete Abstractions. And the good thing about this book is that it's now out of print. So you can get it for free. <laughs> In fact, the author, Hale Perrin, uh, and Kaiser and Knight, what they have done is when the book went out of print, they put it, they got the rights back and they put it online. So now you, and, and I, when I corresponded with, with, with the author, I said, oh gee, that's too bad. I, I said, hey, your book's out of print. How can I get the book? How can I use the book? He said, oh, I said, that's too bad. And he said, no, it's not too bad. It's good. Now it's online. You can get it, access it free. So it's available online. All right. And so this is the one we'll, we'll need, but you don't need the hard copy. That's the one we'll use, but you don't need the hard copy. So this material uh, in computer science and programming, what we're going to do is, um, computer science and programming is his chapter one of, of concrete abstractions. Okay? So now, so now what we're going to do is, uh, what we're going to start doing now is I'm going to show you, we're going to be introduced to, we're, going to, we're going to have an introduction to Scheme, which is this dialect of Lisp. Now, here's, you need to do this right away. On the uh, course web page is, um, I have these setups. All right? So here, uh, you'll see on the course web page there it says setups, and it says programming language setups. And it gives a br brief little description of these uh, three languages. And here you'll notice it says set up for scheme. And if you click that link, here are the instructions for how to get scheme on your computer. And you, tonight you should go home and do this. Okay? There's a link. Um, here's where it says we will be using the Dr. Racket version of scheme for the functional paradigm. Here's the link to the website. Okay, so go to that website, download it, and get it running. Okay? And here is the, here is the, uh, here's, notice that when I mouse over that, it says Dr. Racket. So here's Dr. Racket. And when I click this, oh, I have to do new here. Do it, make a new Dr. Racket. And here's what Dr. Racket looks like. Okay, after you install it, you'll have this IDE. Okay? And so, the way we're going to do a lot of the, go over a lot of the material in this class is we're just going to have a little conversation <clears throat> and we're going to do it with demos. So, this is demo heavy. <coughs> All right? And so let's start then and, and see what we can learn about Scheme uh, using this uh, demo. Now, are you ready for the demo? Here's the demo for today. Notice that um, what we have here is we have an upper screen here and we have a lower screen here. We're going to concentrate on the lower screen here because this has what is called the read. What we're going to demo first is the read eval print loop. Now watch how this works. You see the right here is the prompt, is the scheme prompt, it's that greater than sign. And if I type a number here, like 13, and press return, guess what happens? 13. Now, 
what scheme is doing is it's doing what's known as the read eval print loop. So it read the 13, it evaluated it, then it print, printed the result of the evaluation. So what do we conclude then about a number, an integer like 13? What does it evaluate to? Itself. Yeah, it evaluates to itself. Seven, seven, right? How about, can we do negative numbers? Negative four, negative four. Are you with me? How about, what do you suppose would happen if I did two slash three? Good question. We can experiment. What do you think? It's a fraction. Are you with me? It's not 0.666. If I do 0.666, what do I get? 0.666, right? But check this out. It, it, it knows how to do fractions. So how about, how about if I do this? How about if I do 4, 6? What are you supposed to going to happen? Ah, it knows how to reduce fractions. Okay. And how about if I do 2 plus... Oh, wait, how about if I do plus 3, plus 3, right? That evaluates 3. How about if I do 2 plus 3, what do you suppose is going to happen? Error. Yeah, you think error? Why do you think error? You are right. You are guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be so easy. Yeah, the problem is, is that 2 plus 3 is undefined. Cannot reference an undefined identifier. So that didn't work. So here's the, the first thing that we're going to learn about scheme expressions. How do we add 2 and 3? We have to do it like this. Plus, 2, 3, close parentheses. Now, what, did, what was the loop? And if we, if we press return here, we get 5. So now, what did we say the loop was? The what loop? Read eval, print. So what did this do? It read parentheses plus two, three, close parentheses. It evaluated it. And then it printed the result of the evaluation. Is everybody clear on this? Okay. So that's, so, so what kind of notation do you have? So what does this tell us about scheme or Lisp expressions? They start with a what? Starts with the left parentheses, then what's next? What's first in the, inside the parentheses? The operator, and then what's next? The, the operands, right? And then you close the parentheses, and then it gets evaluated. All right? How about this? What do you suppose this is? Parentheses SQRT space 16. What do you suppose that is? Four, yeah. Okay, and how about if I do, how about if I just do SQRT, what do you suppose is going to happen? Well, actually it's not an error. This is kind of, this is going to become kind of important. Yeah, what do you suppose it is? Look what it is. What does it say it is? It's a procedure, all right? What do you suppose would happen if we did plus? What do you suppose will happen? It's also a procedure, and its name is what? Plus. Are you with me? And does everybody see that the SQRT and the plus all happen, you know, like consistently, right? Now, what do you suppose? Now, I just found this out myself. What about this? 2 plus 3i. What does that look like? And imagine it, a complex number, right? Mm -hmm. Look, it knows how to do 2 plus 3i. As a matter of fact, check this out. What happens if you do SQRT of negative 1? What do you suppose that is? Yeah, which, which imaginary number? 0 plus 1i. So it knows how to do imaginary numbers. But on the other hand, you know, if we do 2 space plus space, oh here, let's do, let's do 3i. Well, does it recognize 3i? Oh, it's undefined. But if I do 0 plus 3i, then what? 
zero plus three i. And it's green, you know it's good. Green is good. <laughs> oh, we knew that before we pressed return. Is that did it turn green before I pressed return? No. Oh. Oh, good question. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, the question is, can we add more than one number? So how, what would we try? Plus what? Three, five, eight, like that? What do you think? Yes, green. Oh, it's green. <laughs> yeah, so we can do more than one for plus. I don't think that works. What do you suppose was, you know, the neat thing about this scheme is that you can experiment. What do you suppose this? SQRT. Um, 2536. Do you think that's going to work or not? No, it doesn't. Let's see. So plus is a little bit different from SQRT. And how about this? Hyphen 7, that's negative 7, right? Now what about, so, so, and what about this? Parentheses, oh here, let's do parentheses minus um, 5, 2. What will that be? What do you suppose that'll be? Three. What about this? What about minus two? What will that be? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Wait. Didn't I do? Ne didn't we just do negative seven? Yeah. That's just that's hmm. that works, right? And, and okay. And how about this? How about this? Minus negative seven. How about that? Seven. Yeah, that works. Is everybody with me on this? Okay. So now, how would you do? How and we can obviously nest these things, right? And it's all it's all really slick uh, syntax with all of these parentheses. So how, so what? Tell me what what is this? Times two plus. 3, 4, paren, paren. So what does this do first? Three plus it is 4 and then times multiple two. times 2. So that's 14. Does everybody see how we can nest? We good? Okay. And now here's another thing we can do. We can, we, what, what, what do you suppose happens if I do pi? You think that's built in? It is, right? But now let's do, a, let's do um, another thing. Let's Show, let's see how define works. If I say define, so here's how define works. Suppose we say define my pi. Oh, by the way, if I just do my pi at first, what do you suppose is going to happen? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, uh, it's an undefined identifier. So let's define it. Let's define my pi to be 3.14. 3.1416. That's the one I learned when I was in high school. Oh, it didn't do anything. But now what happens if I say my pi? Three point, it, so it's been given a value. Does everybody see how that works? Okay. So now, what happens if I do SQRT? And what happens if I do, it tells you it's a procedure, and what happens if I do SQRT, SQRT 25? Huh. It's 5. But now what do you suppose happens if we do SQR 5? What's that going to be? Square. Oh, that's built in also. That's the square. Oh, that's a good question. If I, if I def try, to t try to define SQR, let's see. I don't know. Let's define. Oh, define what? Pi? Yeah, or SQR or something. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try to define pi to be 3.114. Let's try to define pi to be 3.14. Oh, assignment disallowed. Cannot change constant PI, right? Okay, and by the way, this is this one nice thing about um, you can just experiment and nothing will, nothing will hurt the system. You, it's almost impossible. It's virtually indestructible. So let's, let's how about this? Let's do, let's do S-Q-U-A-R-E instead of S-Q-R. Let's do S-Q-A-R-E. Now, this is undefined. So we can actually define it. Um, now watch this. 
what is, if I want to square 5, what do I do? You times 5, 5. Are you with me? And if we do times 5, 5, that's 25. Okay, so now watch this. Here comes the first big paradigm shift. Do you see this little here? Do you see what the um, logo is on the Dr. Racket thing? It's a Greek letter. Can anybody tell what that Greek letter is? It's lambda, L-A-M-B-D-A. -A. Now look at this. When we have scheme and we put a parenthesis lambda, what's always the first thing after the parenthesis? That's the what? No. Operator. Yes, the operator, which is a function or a procedure, right? It's a procedure. So what is what must lambda be? It must be, because it's the first thing after the print, what is it? It's, it's a function. Actually, we should probably start calling them, I, I kind of wish they, they, they said function instead of procedure, because this is the functional paradigm. So I, let's just keep, let's call them functions, right? So that's a function. So, so lambda must be a function because that's the first thing that comes after the, the parentheses, right? Now watch this. The way we define our, the way we do the square is we do lambda parentheses x close parentheses. And now what is the definition of the square of lambda? What do we have to do to square lambda to x? It's times x x close parentheses close parentheses. Are you with me? Now, can anybody, anybody predict what's going to happen when we press return? No. Well, uh, it's something we've seen before. It's a procedure. Are you with me? But look, what's the difference between that procedure and up here? It doesn't have a name. Does everybody, is everybody with me on this? So what does this lambda, what does this lambda return? It returns a what? It returns a function or a procedure, right. It returns a function. All right, so now tell me, therefore, how do we, how would we square Five. What would we do? We would put parentheses, and now we can't put S Q U A R E because that's not defined, right? But we can put what? Are you ready for this? We can put what? Parentheses what? Lambda, lambda, x. Are you with me? Space times x x. Now let's close the paren and close the paren. Now. What's the first thing after the outer perim? That is a what? That's our what? That's our function. And so if we want to square 5, what would we do? Space and now what? Put what? If we want to square it, we put 5. And then close the perim. Now. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so now what's going to happen when we press return? 25. It'll be 25. Can you name it something? Ah, but you see, it would be more, much more convenient if we could name it. But before we do that, let's go, let's go back to our Let's go back and see what we did. What we just typed there, as we can see on this slide, is a lambda expression. Okay? And the main thing that we learned is that a lambda expression evaluates to a function. So when we typed parentheses, lambda, parentheses x, and then parentheses times xx, close paren, close paren, that whole thing is a function. And the way it works is this, after the word lambda, comes a pair of parentheses inside which there is a parameter list. And then what comes 
on the rest of the lambda expression is what that function returns when you invoke it. Does everybody see how that works? So, so what we have to remember, what we, re, what we get from this is that lambda is a function that returns a function. Lambda is a function that returns a function, which makes sense because what paradigm are we in here? The functional paradigm. Are you with me? So functions are, <clears throat> are objects in the language that we can manipulate. Just like integers and doubles and fractions and complex numbers. We can manipulate a function just like we can anything else. You see what, you see what the idea is there? So, so now, let's go back to our Dr. Racket and see then how we would, so in order for this to be, in order for this to be useful, we would, we would need to name it. But before we name it, okay, here's a little class exercise for you. You guys have, says, has anybody downloaded Scheme yet? Maybe not. Okay, well, let's do this together. Um, tell me, what is the, um, what's the area of a circle? What's the formula for the area of a circle with radius r? Pi r squared. Okay, so let's find the radius of a circle of like say 25. All right, so now how would we write the, how would we write the, how would we write the function that computes the area of a circle with radius r? Uh, we could do it either way. But before we get that far, what's the first thing we have to do? Lambda, L-A-M-B-D-A. So this would be lambda, and how many parameters do we have? One, one and that's going to be R. And then, and now, how would we do pi R squared? Parentheses, multiplication is good. And then pi, should we use pi, or we, we could use my pi. Let's use my, isn't my pi already defined? Yeah. Okay, my pi. And then open up another parentheses. And then S, Q, R. Let's suppose, that's the one that's built in, right? Yeah. Okay, S, Q, R, and then what? R. R, and then close paren, and then close paren. Now here's the thing, there's a lot of parens in this, in, in Lisp. And then another what? And you, but you see how it highlights where the matching paren is. One more paren, right? So now that whole thing is the function to calculate the area. Now what do we want the area of? Say uh, radius 25. So we put 25 and watch this. And, but then we have to do another what? Close paren. And so what will that be? 1963.5. Now, does everybody, does everybody see how that works? Okay. <clears throat> but now, that's really inconvenient. What if we wanted to find the area again? Yeah, we'd have to type that whole thing. So instead of typing the whole thing again, what should we do first? Give it a what? Give it a name. But we know how to give names to things because, look, right up here, we gave a name using what? Define. So, you guys, can somebody tell me then the Lisp way or the scheme way to define the area, a function named area that does what we want it to do? Okay, so, what, so what's the very first thing that I, do I write? Define like this? Ah, so define, okay, yeah, define, and we have to give it a name. Area, just like we gave my pi uh, a value. And now it's com common practice to press return here. And then what? Parentheses. Parentheses, what? Lambda. And now what goes here? R. And then what? Parentheses. What? 
times my pi, and then what? SQR. R. Now watch what happens when we close out the parens. Paren, 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 and now that's the, the end of the define, right? So what's going to happen when I press return? Nothing. But it is defined now. So now what can we say? We can say what? Area 25. And boom, 1963.5. Now, one more thing. If we quit this now, if we quit Dr. Racket or Dr. Scheme, whatever it is, and come back, the problem is all of our definitions will be lost. S well, not inside, well, it's inside this, uh, inside this bottom pane where it's, it's doing the read eval print. Um, those definitions are only saved for that session. Once you quit and come back, they're gone. But that's what this top pane is for, right? This top pane, what this top pane does is it lets you, it lets you, um, and this is how you write a program. It lets you take all your definitions like this and put them up here like that. Are you with me? And then what you do is you click the run button. Now suppose there's a mistake here. Suppose we leave out, let's, let's, let's leave off a parentheses and let's click run here and see what happens. Oh, there was an error. So we'll fix our error and we click run. Now when you click run up here on the upper right, it erases your whole session that you had before, but this is now defined. But since you defined my yeah, that session, won't it not work? You're right, it won't. Because now if I say, if we say area 25, it did not save my pi because my pi was undefined. So we would have to define, we would either have, oh, and look what it said. It, it figured it out that the, here was the problem. It gave you that error there. So what you have to do is you would have to define my pi here also. Okay, and now when we click run, it compiled it. And now when we say area 25, it shows what that is. So now here's what you have to do. When you, oh, by the way, we have a homework assignment due um, Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. I believe that's correct. Mm -hmm. So what you do is, the way you do your, your scheme programs is up here at the top, the comment is the semicolon, two semicolons, and you put name, uh, date, you always do this. Assignment, like that. Put your name, your, na your name, the date, the assignment, and then you can put like exercise. Um, exercise, blah blah blah. And then you write, and then you write the function. You're always in scheme. Everything is a function. That's the functional paradigm. Everything is a function. So you write your functions like that. You come up here, you do, um, where's the save? Oh, save definitions, or save definitions as. These, these are definitions, right? Define, define, define. You're always saving definitions, okay? So you save your definitions, and then um, you go to, let's check out our web page again. You come back here. And we do submit homework electronically. So now, the way you submit your homework electronically in this class for you Pepperdine students is I give you a two-digit number that you prepend to your file. Those of you who are in my data structures class, that's the same way we did it there. Okay, so we have an assignment due on Thursday. Good deal. See you tomorrow, same time, same station.